hello, thanks for joining us. I'm Mike Duran. I am the director of the Center for Peace and Security in the Middle East at the Hudson Institute. And this today is an event on the rising Iranian threat. Um, and we have uh, joining us here, uh, my colleague uh, in the Middle East Center, uh, Jonathan Schachter. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, good day. And then our honored guests are from uh, the Institute for uh, Science and International Security. I had to look down on it. I always get it wrong. I don't know why. The good, uh, the good ISIS, our, um, uh, our good friend here, David Albright. He's the president um, uh, of the Institute. Uh, and joining him uh, is uh, Henrik uh, Rasmussen, uh, who is the executive director of the good ISIS. Hello, gentlemen. Thanks for joining us. Hello, good to be here. Thanks for having us. And uh, we wanted to start with, you have an interesting new report out um, uh, on the um, Iran threat Geiger counter. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what I think the report is about, and then you can uh, correct me uh, 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 if I'm wrong. But I get a sense that, uh, that you gentlemen who run uh, the good ISIS is the most serious um, and uh, technologically grounded uh, institute on counterproliferation um, in the United States, possibly in the in the whole uh, world. Um, and uh, I, I sense in your reports a, a growing concern about the rising Iranian threat, and a growing concern about the complacency about that threat. And you're trying to raise a, a, a tension. Um, uh, and you've come up with a new matrix for explaining to people the nature of the threat. Uh, Henrik, let's start with you. Do I, do I have that right? Is that what's happening here? No, that, that's absolutely correct. Uh, what we've come up with in a new concept called the Iran threat Geiger counter. Uh, and obviously uh, a Geiger counter uh, measures uh, radioactive danger and uh, any uh, point of radioactivity is dangerous. So uh, we have a, a big scale. I don't know if you, you wanna bring up the graphic. I can maybe introduce us uh, to that right here. Sure, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll bring up the graphic right now. So what you see there is a counter uh, with a score from zero uh, or range from zero to 180 uh, of danger uh, on the Geiger counter. Uh, we have uh, basically divided that into six categories uh, and they are broadly divided into uh, um, two types uh, of danger. One is Iran's intentions and the other is Iran's capabilities as it relates to developing uh, and deploying nuclear weapons. Uh, on the intention side, we look at both their actions, actions speak louder than words, uh, and uh, their rhetoric. Uh, you should always uh, be careful uh, and uh, not underestimate uh, what your opponent uh, is actually publicly stating. So we take uh, the Iranians uh, at their word when they say, uh, death to America and death to Israel on a regular basis. Uh, and then we have a number of uh, parameters we look at uh, in terms of Iran's capabilities uh, on the nuclear front. Maybe I'll turn it over to, to David to go through uh, those four parameters. Yeah, on the nuclear side, um, we're looking at the, Iran's transparency, which, which really means it's transparency to the International Atomic Energy Agency. And it's the transparency under its safeguards agreement, um, which is the more fundamental document. And then also under this joint comprehensive plan of action, which is layered on additional monitoring. And, and overall, Iran doesn't do very well on that. Um, another category is what we call breakout. Um, and obviously they, from our point of view, the time to break out now in the sense of having enough weapon grade, I'm sorry, highly, highly enriched uranium for a nuclear weapon is, is now at zero. If they wanted to make the weapon grade uranium, which is uh, perhaps better suited for their types of nuclear weapons, they could do it very quickly. Um, Sorry, uh, David, to interrupt there, but when you say when you say very quickly, would you just give us a sense of what we're talking about? How much uh, material for how many bombs in how many months or weeks? Well, they could they could produce the enough for the first one in in less than two weeks. Uh, in a month, they could have enough for five. And in three months, they could have enough for seven. So they, they have a, a very robust ability to make the basic materials for nuclear weapons. 
And then it also we we also because that's that's not the time to make a bomb. We also look at the question of the weaponization of the of the weapon grade uranium into a weapon, and that 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 um, evaluation is 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 based on um, what we know about their past and possibly ongoing nuclear weapons efforts, and and making judgments about how close they are to to being able to make a bomb and how fast they would do it. And then the last criteria we use is, is a general one on just their growing nuclear capability. How many centrifuges they've installed, particularly the advanced ones, are they, you know, how, how are they playing around with the centrifuge, uh, centrifuges to be able to make the highly enriched uranium? You know, they're making 60% enriched uranium regularly. They, they've been increasing their capability to do that. They've been playing games in arrangements of cascades so they could more efficiently make weapon grade uranium if they chose to do it. Um, they're also um, playing around with, with um, the basic uh, capability of building centrifuges so that they could make more of them uh, if they chose to and put them in facilities, new facilities that are more even more deeply buried than the Fordo on which so uh, the the new facilities, can you give us just a, a little bit of a, a sense of that? Because I, I, I know you've written reports on this in the past, but I, I don't think this has gotten the attention it deserves. Well, it, the new facility, it's really the, the main concern is over one new facility that Iran is building next to the Natanz and Richmond plant. Um, and, it's, and it turns out that when you do the analysis based on how basically where the tunnel entrances are. And then if you just look at the going into that mountain with tunnels that are even just horizontal, more than likely they're, they go downward. They're very unlikely to go upward, but they, if you do that and you look at the, for the, how high that mountain is, you end up with, with um, a facility inside that mountain that'll be more deeply buried than the Ford Allen Richmond plant, which is which is already pretty deeply buried. And, and, and one of the surprises is that if you, you look at the space available, you look at where the tunnel entrances, and there are four of them that come in, in toward the center of the mountain, it's gonna be a very large facility. Iran has announced that that facility would replace the Iran centrifuge assembly facility that was destroyed in the summer of 2020, but it's much bigger than is what, what is needed for that. And so there's a, a general sense among us, certainly among the Israeli analysts, that that place is also probably gonna hold a gas centrifuge plant. And uh, so correct me if I'm, uh, if I'm wrong, but uh, this, uh, this new facility is in a kind of a gray zone with respect, respect to international law and reporting uh, because it's it's not uh, it, it's not yet a nuclear site because they're not really doing any nuclear work there, but they're preparing it to to, to do nuclear work there. Um, and is is that one of the reasons why there hasn't been um, the kind of alarm around this that there was around the original discovery of Natanz and Fordo? Well, one of the on the legal side, if Iran is planning to put an enrichment plant in it, then under the the IA safeguards arrangements, it should declare that as soon as it starts to make the plans to do it, even before construction starts. Um, Iran rejects that interpretation and makes its own based on a 20, 30 year old um, precursor to the current legal requirement um, and says, no, we can, we can tell you much, much later. And, but the IA rejects that and, 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 and regularly reminds Iran that it, if it's going to build a new nuclear site, it needs to tell them before, essentially before construction starts. And, and, and so here you have a situation, uh, this uh, new complex near Natanz where you don't, Iran's not saying anything and you don't know what's going on. So Iran's um, just making it more difficult to figure out what's happened. And, and it's left to people like me and and, uh, and people and governments to try to make sense of what's going on. And, and you have to, unfortunately, um, worry about the worst. I mean, we, you don't need to make big accusations. And that's partly why it hasn't received as much attention 
as it might have. But still, you do have to worry because they've done they've built enrichment plants in secret twice. Um, the Tons was done secretly without telling the IA to, until the IA basically confronted them about it. It, it was we were involved in creating the evidence that there, there was a secret Natanz enrichment plant. Um, and then Fort Al had to be discovered through intensive intelligence means, which, which may have included this, this Iranian who was executed in January um, that was a spy for the British who revealed it. So it took some extraordinary measures to find this secret Fort Al site and the, and the site was, it was about ready to, Iran was getting ready to install centrifuges. It installed the piping for the centrifuges and it was getting ready to install the centrifuges, all done in secret. So, so Iran is a, a perpetual cheater. And so when you then look at this site near Natanz, it wouldn't surprise me at all that they will put an enrichment plant in, in that facility. Um, the New York Times just had a, uh, a long article on uh, the, the spy who was executed in January. And one of the aspects that uh, I found most interesting about what was revealed there um, was the Russian role in, in, helping, the, um, in helping the Iranians to um, affirm that he was, in fact, the spy. Exactly how the Russians knew wasn't clear. Um, but uh, Western intelligence people and, and the Iranians themselves, I think, have... Uh, um, have confirmed to the New York Times that the Russians helped them with that. Um, uh, uh, Henrik, is this um, uh, this kind of thing the growing um, the growing uh, diplomatic um, uh, the growing alliances, I guess, and uh, diplomatic strength of um, uh, Iran? Is that one of the things that's going into the Geiger counter to to show uh, Iran's rising power and your concern about it? Uh, yes. Uh, so we look at uh, Iran's uh, hostile intentions uh, towards the United States and towards uh, our European allies uh, and our allies in the Middle East, East uh, such as Israel. Uh, obviously, there's a big and deepening uh, relationship between Iran and Russia. Uh, Iran has supplied uh, hundreds of drones that Russia has uh, deployed against the uh, Ukraine uh, in the illegal invasion of uh, Ukraine. And there's speculation now that, that the Russians might construct a drone factory uh, to build uh, Iranian designed drones uh, on their own soil uh, in Russia and to scale up uh, production. So all of that figures into an assessment uh, around Iran's hostile uh, intentions and the threat that Iran poses to our NATO allies in particular when we're talking about uh, uh, you know, Iranian hardware being deployed on, uh, on European soil uh, against uh, um, certainly a partner, uh, if not a NATO ally uh, like, uh, like Ukraine. Um, you also have a number of other uh, examples of Iran um, uh, attacking uh, uh, European allies. Uh, you had a cyber attack uh, against the Albanian government uh, last year. Uh, so all of that also figures into the Albanian threat assessment. Sorry, the Albanian government, because it hosts uh, one of the most uh, prominent um, anti-regime organizations. That, that, that's correct. Uh, and so obviously... Uh, uh, it, it's worrisome uh, when Iran is developing uh, nuclear capabilities in that kind of context. And I think we'd, we'd like to uh, not just uh, caution U.S. policymakers, but also European policymakers, that this is a threat that everybody needs to wake up to. And I think we've certainly also seen, because of Iran's uh, uh, overt um, uh, support of Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, you've now seen European policymakers starting uh, to take uh, Iran and the threat from Iran much more seriously and, and, and pay more uh, attention there than they did in the past. Well, um, uh, I, I see that there's a, a kind of um, rising awareness in Europe about this. Um, but Jonathan, let me bring you in here. I I, I've been following the Iran question for at least 20 years, 
And I don't remember a moment like this when there was such um, uh, such a extensive amount of evidence of hostile intention to combined with rising capabilities, as our friends at uh, the good ISIS have pointed out, um, without any kind of corresponding action. So there's no one there's no one who's denying who's out there denying what. Um, um, what what uh, what our colleagues here at the Good ISIS are saying, but I don't see any level of uh, of of action that might possibly deter Iran from the from the the course it's on. I'd like to get your analysis of that. Um, first of all, do you agree with me? I assume you do, but uh, if you don't, I'd be I'd be interested in hearing how you don't as well. Uh, yes, Mike, I do agree with you. I think that's exactly right. We see on the one hand um, multiple indications of of growing threat and i think that um our friends at the good isis have done uh done us a great service by by putting it into a, a format that is um uh, sort of concentrates that and makes it easy to uh to understand um and it's being met by what looks like sort of a a, a shrug and that's the shrug is not new. The shrug has been going on for uh, for quite a while. You have um, it's now May 2023, um, so we have four years of Iranian uh, violations of the JCPOA, um, which is you know distinct from its violations of its uh, safeguards agreement, as as David mentioned. Uh, that have gotten increasingly grave. And uh, I can show you a stack of uh, press releases from European countries and from the EU about how these, these violations are uh, of great concern, how this step or that step uh, has no justification in civilian terms, how no country is enriching uh, at as high a level for reasons that are not nuclear weapons. And that's it. Um, there's no no action has been taken. Um, the Europeans are still uh, actually the only ones who are 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 I guess uh, except for Russia and China who are, who are nominally in the JCPOA. They have the ability to activate the snapback mechanism, which is supposed to be in you know used in cases of of. Uh, of serious violations of the JCPOA's terms, which are indisputable at this point, and yet the Europeans uh, have not done that, nor have they done anything else. I think the, the, the real question right now, perhaps I'm jumping ahead a little bit, is, uh, as Henrik mentioned, you have this, this drone threat um, coming from uh, Iranian and Russian cooperation, um, in October of this year, unless the snapback is activated, the missile embargo, the UN missile embargo on Iran is scheduled to be lifted under the terms of Security Council Resolution 2231, which was part and parcel of the, the JCPOA. Uh, that'll be lifted. And so it's. I'm curious to see what the Europeans in particular are gonna do uh, now that European cities are actually under uh, the threat of Iranian missiles in in Russian hands. Yeah, the, uh, thank you, Jonathan. You know um, that um, October deadline for the um, for the removal of the missile embargo. Um, that uh, seems to me to be one of the reasons why the Iranians are um, enriching less than ninety percent. I'm hearing in the diplomatic circles that the 90% enrichment level is the red line for the Europeans. Uh, and they have agreed that uh, among themselves, I, I, I don't know if this is true, I'm gonna turn to you, David, to affirm whether my information is correct or not, uh, that the Europeans are among themselves agreeing that if the Iranians go past 90%, then they will move to take uh, greater action in the United Nations and with regard to sanctions and other ways of pressuring the Iranians. Is that your, is that your understanding? Both of the um, of the European thinking and also uh, presumably of the Iranian thinking. I, I think yes. My understanding is that the Europeans talk about ninety percent as the as the trigger for snapback. And I think there there's been a debate, including in governments, 
um, some have argued that well, there's not much left. I mean, not much, much left, much space left between where Iran's at now and then escalating. It'll inevitably go to ninety percent. I mean, others say that's not true, and we we decided to do an analysis of how many provocative steps, escalatory steps, could Iran take short of going to ninety percent that would move it down the path of nuclear weapons capability, but would not hit that European red line. And we found four pages worth, each one a bullet on the kind of steps Iran could take in all kinds of areas that would be short of going to 90%. And so I think Iran has a lot of ways to more thinly slice the salami and avoid the European red line while moving its nuclear weapons capabilities forward. And I, and I think your point that that they have an incentive not to not to cross that line um, until things like the missile embargo end. Uh, they may even want to stretch this out and catch uh, pick up the end of the uh, snapback itself in 2025. So the, um, the, the 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 missile embargo ends in October of 2023, and and snapback ends uh, uh, what month in 2025? It would be October of 2025. October of of, uh, uh, of 2025. These these uh, salami tactics that you're talking about that would advance their capabilities. And what can you just give us a little bit of a sense for those of us who are not tech, technical experts? What kind of um, what kind of uh, capabilities are they improving, and how do how do they improve through these incremental oh, actions? Yeah. The most obvious one is is when they may have actually implemented, which is to they've been enriching to sixty percent in a regular basis, and then and then they play games and they start to enrich to eighty four percent. They could go to eighty six percent. They could go even to eighty percent, and and they and so they're they can go put in achieve enrichment levels between sixty and ninety percent. They can rearrange cascades so that they're explicitly able to go to 90%, but just not do it. They could put in equipment that would allow the recovery of the 90% product to be uh, recovered more efficiently. They could, they could escalate the number of advanced centrifuges they put in, um, put in, in, in arrangements that would allow them to produce a lot more um, 90% uh, if they decided to do that using 5% enriched uranium stocks 20% enriched uranium stocks and 60% and enriched uranium stocks. And then they, they could do all kinds of things also with, with um, delaying the International Atomic Energy Organization's um, progress. So, so this is like, we, we, the way we should think of this about what's going on right now, if, if the West sets a ceiling of 90%, um, uh, then it allows them these games that the, the Iranians are, are playing. This is this is sort of practice for the big game, so that they hone they hone their skills, they learn the techniques, um, uh, and when it comes time and they decide that they really do want to go for a weapon, they can go very quickly and efficiently without any mistakes. Is that the way I should be understanding this? That's right, and 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 it and partly what we we know they can go from sixty percent to ninety percent quickly, and that's when when you have U.S. officials saying they can do it in twelve days. We we say they can do it in. You know, about the same amount of time. I can't remember if it's eleven or thirteen days. There, it's it's just take, taking a few centrifuges, a few hundred, and in two or three cascades, and enriching to sixty up to ninety percent. Well, they they also have big stocks of twenty percent, and they could work on more efficient production of ninety percent using the twenty percent, and and they don't and they don't have to go to ninety percent, but they so they could do that even more quickly. Um, and they could develop those skills um, and never never go to 90%. But, but when they decide to do it, they'll be able to do a, enrich all of this enriched uranium up to 90% in just a matter of a few weeks. So it, it'll happen so quickly. The I, IAEA may not even know it's happened if Iran has turned off the sort of the real-time monitoring system. It denies some access to the inspectors because they say, well, there's a fire, there's, you know, there's been a security breach. So you were allowing Iran to develop a capability to produce 
enough weapon grade uranium for multiple nuclear weapons in a time frame where we may not even know it happens. So, uh, Henrik, Henrik uh, let me take you back to this question of why um, the alarm that you guys are expressing and that I think Jonathan and I feel is not more universally shared. We're not hearing it as much on the airwaves. Um, you know, there's, there's a, a relatively small community of people who are genuinely very seriously alarmed, um, but we're not seeing that uh, uh, alarm expressed by the relevant governments. Now, what, what's happening inside the IAEA? In the past, when, when Iran has done these things, the IAEA has been one of those elements that has been there to express a concern of the, um, the, the, the broader concern and to highlight it. Why, why aren't we seeing that now? I think I'll let David answer the question on the IAEA, and then uh, I'll make a broader point around uh, the, the Europeans, but I'll, I'll turn it to David first. Well, the IAEA um, is trying. It, it's trying to, and, and fundamentally what it's trying to do is, is get Iran in compliance with its safeguards obligation, which is to tell the whole truth about its nuclear program and how much, particularly how much nuclear material it has. The, through the IA's work, they've demonstrated Iran has not done that. They have undeclared nuclear material. And, and they've been trying for like, upwards of three years to try to get Iran to cooperate, and they, and they just won't. Um, there's also been issues of Iran reducing the monitoring arrangements under the JCPOA, and, the, and Iran may have, may have made some concessions to reinstall some cam cameras, and they may be doing that. Um, but they're not giving the data from those cameras to the IA as and they stopped doing that a while ago. And, and so the IA's ability to monitor at, under the JCPOA has been reduced. Um, and I will say in the in the in the Geiger counter, we in this in this version, this edition, we give Iran credit for that reinstall, trying to willingness and to reinstall the cameras. Um, we, we actually boost their score a little bit because of that, but that's overwhelmed by the, um, the lack of transparency in the important area of safeguards and the question of undeclared nuclear materials. But, but you have to, uh, you, Henrik, you have to give the Iranians credit. I, they, they understand the West <laughs> and its, its reluctance to get serious so well, and they know how to give a little bit you know, to, to, to keep the process, to keep the negotiation going while they continue to advance. Uh, that's my reading of the, uh, of the, you know, of the turning on the cameras, but not sharing the data. And so, and so, but, I, but, the, the amount of creative intelligence that goes into this is really remarkable. But I think what this ultimately comes down to is U.S. Uh, leadership. I mean, the Europeans have a lot going on uh, with, uh, with the war in Ukraine. Uh, they have their hands full uh, having to arm themselves to live up to their NATO uh, commitments uh, in uh, uh, sort of the, the, their own neighborhood. Um, and so to, for them to lean in uh, to the emerging threat from Iran you really have to see the Biden administration signal to the Europeans that this is something that the U.S. will prioritize. Otherwise, it becomes uh, an incredible political risk uh, for Europeans uh, to go in and focus on Iran in the midst of all of these other issues. And, and then on top of that, you have uh, you know economic issues on the domestic front and so on uh, that you're dealing with. Uh, so you've seen uh, the, the recent riots in, in Paris as an example of that. Um, so uh, there's not a lot of uh, sort of political capital for European leaders to spend, uh, and, and that's why you need the, the Biden administration to, to signal that this is a U.S. priority and that the Biden administration will have their back uh, uh, and, and that Europe and the U.S. can form a united front on the Iran problem. Uh, and I, uh, Jonathan, I don't see any... Um... Uh, I don't see any inclination whatsoever on the part of the Biden administration to take that um, absolutely indispensable step. Uh, what, what's your analysis of, uh, um, of their position here? And, and also, how do you read the Israelis on this now? Well, I would also, I would take a step back for a second to your, the question you would ask, David, about the IAEA. 
I, I look at the IAEA as sort of two organizations in one. On the one end, you have the IAEA professionals whose job is to uh, um, you know, monitor and uh, ideally ensure compliance with uh, safeguard agreements and, and other agreements that they've, they've, uh, they've been assigned. And the technical professionals are the ones who are out there doing the inspections. But then you have the second body, which is the Board of Governors, which is made up of, of the member states. And that's where I think the uh, the, the political will and the political forces that Henrik is, is describing uh, manifest themselves as well. And I think the, the, the things that are distracting the Europeans um, and the things that are distracting the United States for that matter are, are intertwined and in some ways manifest themselves uh, at the Board of Governors. And so uh, Henrik Rightly, you know, points out that there are all these different things on the European agenda. I'm sure that in the White House, they would tell you there are all these other things that are on the American agenda. And at the end of the day, you find yourself in a position where everyone is busy and everyone has a reason to do something else, but you'll find yourself with a nuclear armed Iran. Now, where the, where the war, I think, really comes into play here is that um, there's a dynamic which... Um, which uh, uh, David and Henrik uh, mentioned in their report, which is Iran is in violation of its, of its agreement with the IAEA. Uh, you'll have a quarterly uh, meeting of the Board of Governors, and all of a sudden there'll be dialogue between the IAEA and, uh, and Iran, and Iran will make these sorts of, of promises and gestures, and uh, it'll look like it's just enough to avoid getting some sort of a resolution of censure or something like that at the at the Board of Governors meeting. But in some ways, the board of the, the war has made the Board of Governors um, an empty threat, because at the end of the day, if you get a resolution of censure, the next step um, for enforcement would be to refer it to the Security Council. And it would be one thing if you had all of the members of the Security Council willing to punish Iran or take some you know, punitive measures or deterrent measures. But the, the, the idea that the Russians or the Chinese are going to do that right now in the current environment vis-a-vis -vis the United States and Europe, um, I think the likelihood is, is zero. So what that would end up doing is showing how, 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 how weak the, the diplomatic tools are that that either of them have. That's actually one of the nice things about the snapback is that it doesn't require um, the ascension of uh, the other uh, members of the P5. Any one of the P5 can, can, can do, except the United States at this point, can do it um, by itself. So I, I, I think where, where that leaves um, the administration and the Europeans for that matter is facing Iran that is um, violating its obligations under the JCPOA and the Safeguards Agreement, um, unwilling to cooperate with the IAEA, and uh, facing uh, increasingly weak um, diplomatic tools to prevent it. And so all of these things are making, I think, two scenarios more likely, which is either a nuclear armed Iran or the use of force to prevent that. And I think there's um, no appetite in, in Washington or in the European capitals uh, for uh, the use of force, which makes the sort of the, the, the default outcome look more and more like either uh, a nuclear armed Iran or an Israeli use of force. And I think, I think in Israel, they understand the way this dynamic is going. And um, there seems to be a growing understanding that ultimately um, Israel may have to, to face this threat um, by itself. Well, let me, let me stay with you there, Jonathan, a little bit and, and just tease this out. Um, uh, I don't, we've, you, you basically just have explained very cogently why we're, we're not going to see what the, the Europeans are not going to act without American leadership. The United States, uh, President Biden, is not going to want to take any action, um, certainly not before the 2024 election. Iran is going to continue to go forward. Israel is left alone on the playing field. What you're saying is that Israel would have to use force 
against the will of the United States. The United States is not going to delegate it because it, it doesn't want to do this anyway. It doesn't want to do it itself. It's not going to want Israel to do it because that could draw the United States in. So how do the Israelis, do, do you, do you um, expect the Israelis to defy the Biden administration? Um, and if so, what kind of scenario do you imagine? I, I don't see it as defiance of the Biden administration. I think, you know, one of the things that's been, uh, with all the, uh, the the political turmoil in Israel, one of the things that has been consistent um, for uh, for years now and and across governments was Israel's policy, which is Israel will not uh, allow Iran to uh, to get a nuclear weapon. And so that's that's the that's the Israeli policy that was of the the um, past and present Netanyahu governments and of the Bennett and Lapid governments. Uh, uh, in between, and I think they've made that position uh, eminently clear. And I don't think they're they're not looking for uh, anybody's uh, permission because they understand what's at stake. I um, my my own view is a, is slightly different. I, I understand that that's their position, um, and uh, it, it's one that I find uh, um, eminently reasonable. Um, and I find them to be more sane on this issue than anyone else in the arena. But when it comes time to give the go order to uh, to go send troops into battle, if the United States is against Israel on this, um, it's going to it seems to me it's going to be very hard for Prime Minister Netanyahu to say yes, especially look at the we look now at the at the growing rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and and Iran that the diplomatic arena that American appeasement of Iran is creating in the neighborhood is making is making the neighborhood less not more permissive to Israel for some kind of uh, significant uh, military action so how, do you really expect that uh, that that prime minister Netanyahu will say go with all of this opposition on his streets and with uh, you know to, to his government on his streets and with the uh, and with an American administration that's really against the move, I think that if the prime minister were presented with uh, an intelligence picture that said um, it's either now or never, and never means uh, Israel will be facing um, uh, a nuclear armed Iran that explicitly calls for Israel's annihilation, that I think he would do that. Um, I would say perhaps with a heavy heart. Um, and um, uh, and with a, I think a full understanding of the gravity of the decision, but I, I think um, I think that Israeli history has a number of examples where um, there were uh, there were actions that Israel thought that it had to take um, for um, uh, for very severe. Uh, uh, nuclear uh, national security threats, uh, and it did, despite the opposition uh, of the United States and uh, and other countries. So yes, I th I think that I think that he would do that. As to the you know, Saudi Iranian rapprochement, I think. The, sorry, just to interrupt you there for the the examples you would give would be the 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 yellow light that Lyndon Johnson gave the Israelis in '67. And again, the yellow light, uh, yellow to red light that George W. Bush gave Ehud Olmert uh, in um, uh, in 2000 and uh, in uh, 2008 uh, with regard seven. to the uh, seven 2007 with seven, regard seven. to the I should know that I was in the government at the time uh, 2007 with regard to the um, the the Syrian uh, Al Kibar reactor um, are those the two you have in mind or are there others. There are others. Oh, there I guess the Iraqi, the Iraqi reactor as well. There was the Iraqi reactor, and there was also, um, uh, I believe, there was opposition to um, the operation in 2002 uh, to go into uh, uh, Palestinian cities to 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 try and stop the suicide bombings. Um, so I think there, are, I think there are a number of examples. Some of them nuclear related, some of them not. Um, where where Israel had to uh, uh, Israel made decisions that it that in, you know in its understanding it had to make uh, for its uh, for its security interests. I, I I remain skeptical because of the 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 size of the the operation here that I think would be in, 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 in that this would entail. But 
um, we can uh, hash this out in a later event. That's be an interesting thing to pursue. Mike, Mike, let me. Can I add one thing? I mean, Please. I, I think you also in, in thinking about um, efforts to set back or destroy Iran's nuclear infrastructure. I think you, you have to keep in mind that that some parts of that infrastructure have been destroyed already. I mean, the the bombing in 2020 of the Iran centrifuge assembly facility set back the Iran's ability to deploy thousands of centrifuges for X number of years, a couple of years. They're, they're recovering, um, but it, albeit slower than they expected. Um, there, if, if you destroy their stocks of 20 and 60% enriched uranium, um, you'd be setting them back. They wouldn't have breakout timelines nearly so, like they have now. So, so I think it, so I think you you have to think through what is a military strike, and and it's a gradation, and then you also have to think through what are you trying to do. Well, one may be to destroy the the infrastructure so they can't do something for some a period. Of time. Another may be that you want to deter them from building nuclear weapons. You want to hit things that 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 say, look, these activities. Um, that reduce your breakout timelines are not acceptable. But if you want to, you know, enrich your low enriched uranium for eventual use in a nuclear power plant, then we're not going to bomb you over that. But so if you're sixty percent, maybe something will happen. So I think, I, I think the whole process has to be thought through very carefully. And I think in some of that, the U.S. will go along. I mean, they're not going to jump up and down publicly, but I don't. I think they may just turn a blind eye to Israeli actions. So your, your answer to me, to my skepticism about the Israelis going it alone, is to say that I'm thinking um, uh, in too black or white a fashion between, between war and not war, and that there are a set of incremental options of sabotage options that could have a deterrent effect on the Iranians, but won't trigger a kind of full-scale war. I mean, the, the thing that I have in mind is a kind of act, action of crossing frontiers um, with F-35s that's going to trigger, uh, you know, the Hezbollah's uh, missiles and the Houthi missiles and possibly even missiles from Iran itself against Israel. Um, and, and then maybe the Iranians taking action in the Persian Gulf uh, to, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to put pressure on global energy supplies uh, this kind of I, I, you're saying, Mike, you're thinking in a kind of too cataclysmic a fashion. There's all kinds of there's all kinds of escalating options that we can carry out that the Israelis could carry out short of that. Is that is that what you're saying? Yeah, I think I think so. And, and even some of them, these things could involve attack aircraft crossing the border, but would not Iran would want to pull back from an action that would start a full scale war because the second strike could be much more devastating and could it actively involve the United States. Uh, so I think, I, I think there is a, we need, and particularly the United States needs to think through ways of, of setting back the program. Um, uh, Israel may be the hammer that does it, but that um, sends the signal, Iran, you just don't wanna build nuclear weapons. Um, David, I, my, my Henrik, my my sense of wh why you guys have produced your Geiger counter is precisely because the United States is not sending that kind of signal uh, uh, right right now. Um, I don't want to put words in your mouth because you you haven't you haven't said that. But uh, is that a, is that a fair interpretation that you're really trying to raise awareness? If if we all agree here that the key the the key factor that can really change the equation is a decision in the White House to send a very significant deterrent message to Tehran. Then that has to be the goal of the Geiger counter. No. Well, I think first of all, we just want to put out uh, the latest information uh, on the technical front in terms of Iran's capabilities and uh, in terms of Iran's non-nuclear actions that indicate their hostile intentions and the threat to both the U.S. and its allies. Of course, uh, that then raises the question of uh, what is it we need to do? And I would fall back to my earlier comment on U.S. leadership being absolutely uh, essential here. And so we will keep 
um, uh, updating the Gaia counter mm -hmm. and presenting the threat level as we see it based on the kind of technical analysis uh, that is our bread and butter. Um, and 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 we will keep uh, you know hopefully reaching both policymakers uh, and concerned citizens on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, such that uh, uh, people will hopefully feel inspired to do something about this uh, threat. Well, and, well, and I can, and I'll add, and the Geiger counter needle is continuing moving to the right, uh, showing increasing danger. And, it, and so it's entering extremely dangerous zones of, of radiation. Be, before I before I let you guys go, let's let me ask you about the the possibility of a of a diplomatic solution to this, and namely, I mean, a return to the the JCPOA. Um, do you guys see? I'll start with the with you, Henrik. Do you see um, um, a uh, a path here to revive the JCPOA? That can um, that can sig significantly reduce Iranian capabilities and signal a change of intentions, um, such that we uh, we could all uh, that we would believe that peace and security in the Middle East had been enhanced. So at the technical level, no, and we've produced a lot of analyses that that show the weaknesses of uh, the JCPOA uh, framework. At the political level. Uh, I am afraid that maybe uh, some parties in both the U.S. and Europe uh, are talking themselves into this. Uh, and so we hope by continuing to produce uh, this kind of technical analysis and, and overview and threat assessment uh, that we can at least make people aware of the dangers uh, of pursuing a, a renewed JCPOA. And I think maybe David can go into detail on some of the, the, the key weaknesses of that framework and, and what a better framework might look like. Yes, and I, I, I think, David, before I turn it to you, I, I think that, uh, Henrik, when you say you produced uh, reports, you're referring, uh, among others, to the report you put out in uh, October, uh, which actually showed that the, the, the Obama administration had put out back when the JCPOA came in these graphs uh, showing the um, uh, the reduction in um, the reduction in stockpiles of the Iranians um, under the JCPOA, uh, but those graphs always conveniently stopped in in in, in 2030, uh, and you 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 then extended the graph forward beyond 2030 to 2031 and 32, and their stockpiles went up you know off of the uh, off of the chart in, entirely. In fact, we'll. Um, Put up that graphic uh, right now, just so people can see that. But is is that uh, just to make sure? Is that the work you're referring to? Correct. Yes. Yeah. And so, uh, David, could you just give us a a, a, a quick uh, summary of some of the, as as Henrik mentioned, some of the technical sides um, uh, of the equation that make a return to the JCPOA um, unmeaningful in terms of what we're talking about? Well, the the fundamental one is is what people call the sunsets. We've talked about one, the end of the ability for snapback in 2025. After 2025, Iran can significantly scale up legitimately its centrifuge program and, and reach levels far beyond what we have today. Um, it doesn't have to satisfy the IEA safeguards concerns under the JCPOA. It can just keep pushing that aside indefinitely, and, and it's fine with the JCPOA mechanism. So and so what you have is, is, is a, a difficult situation. Tomorrow could be significantly worse than today. And it, and it will be if you could revive the JCPOA and Iran remains Iran, the regime stays as it is. And, and, uh, and it's thought, its basic goal is to drive the US out of the region and bolster its own capabilities. And so I think what we're faced with is, is that because tomorrow can be on the nuclear front, much worse than today. Today is the time to do the battle with Iran, to, to wrestle with it, to make sure that it does not build nuclear weapons. Um, and so it's a hard, that's a hard reality to face, but the JCPOA is not gonna save you. It'll only make the situation worse when it comes time to wrestling with Iran to keep them from making the 90% and making nuclear weapons. So. 
today's the time to act. I, um, I, I just want to hone in on that sentence you may you 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 stated because that it's only going to make it worse because you're you, you didn't say what I thought you were going to say is that it will only delay the the inevitable but you're actually saying it's making it worse and uh just in in one sentence it's making it worse because why their nuclear capability will be far larger than today and it'll be legitimate there'll be no basis to launch a military strike against it um though iran will be much more powerful economically militarily it'll have the years to bolster its conventional military forces making a military strike if not impossible, extremely costly and difficult. So I, so I think the delay is not on our side. No, and you can see, uh, Jonathan, the growing uh, cooperation among uh, China, Russia, and Iran, the increasing uh, capabilities in the, that, that Iran is acquiring in the conventional realm um, make everything that uh, uh, David says about the nuclear realm even more, uh, even more disturbing. Jonathan, I, I'll give you the last word here. Do you have some final thoughts to uh, take us home from this? Very, tell tell us something more depressing, Jonathan, because I'm 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 leaving uh, I'm I'm leaving this uh, this discussion feeling pretty uh, pretty grim. Mike, you shouldn't dare me to do things like that. <laughs> um, you know, your, your question you asked if going back to the JCPOA would reduce Iran's capability, but um, as as Henrik and David. Uh, laid out. The JCPOA doesn't do that. The JCPOA expands Iran's nuclear capability. And, um, uh, and, I, and I think David is, is absolutely right. It will leave Iran uh, stronger uh, in terms of nuclear, in terms of its military, and uh, economically and diplomatically. And at the end of the day, because uh, the snapback expires in 2025, it means that the there's a, and, and because of the, the dynamics of the Security Council and the relations with Russia and China right now, the ability to reimpose the kind of pressure and the kind of, of resolutions that passed in the early 2000s uh, on Iran has, has evaporated. And so basically to go back to the JCPOA would be to go back to a, an extremely limited uh, deal for about two years, and that would allow Iran to get all of these benefits and leave the United States, uh, Europe, and uh, and their partners um, at at a, at a major disadvantage to to actually confront this. So I, I completely uh, agree with what David said. I, I'd like to just for a second go back to some first principles, which is at the end of the day, Iran has no need. For, you know, we, we spend all this time we talk about centrifuges and how much they're enriching and to what level. There is no civilian justification for Iran to have uh, an enrichment program. Period, and that was that was really the uh, the, the part of the JCPOA that that turned things uh, I think on their head is that it took an illegally built um, military uh, uranium enrichment program and it decriminalized it. And I think part of what you're seeing with the Saudis uh, right now is essentially an insistence. This was, you know, the, the, the Saudi-China uh, relationship has gotten a lot of attention lately. But in recent years, it was revealed that the Saudis uh, have uh, a, uh, a plant to uh, process uranium ore that they built with Chinese assistance. They've built uh, it was revealed they've, they're uh, building their own ballistic missiles with Chinese assistance. And so essentially what the, the Saudis are doing is insisting on having for themselves the same nuclear capabilities, including ultimately, I expect, the fuel cycle that the JCPOA uh, gave to Iran. Why wouldn't they? Why wouldn't they? Why? I mean, the prior to the, prior to the JCPOA, the, uh, the U.S. policy said that the um, the agreement with the Emiratis was the gold standard, and that prevented them from having the the nuclear cycle. There's no there's no way that the neighbors of Iran are going to let it get the full fuel cycle without trying to get it themselves. And I I would include the Turks in there. The Turks deny this, say that they have a NATO a nuclear umbrella from NATO. They don't need it. 
uh, but it's it, it just stands to reason that once the once the Iranians get it, everyone else is going to get it too. Um, any 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 thinking, any um, argument to the contrary, which we're hearing from the the administration, is uh, pure sophistry. I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in with that um, editorial comment, and I'll end this on that note. You guys have been thoroughly depressing. Uh, I want to thank you. It's you know somebody has to grim up. And tell the unpleasant truths, uh, and uh, I guess that's our uh, that's our job. Um, but um, I don't want to have you over for a cocktail party, all right? Because you guys are just a bunch of downers. Thank you very much. I appreciate your uh, I appreciate your negativity, and uh, we hope to have you back soon. <laughs>